Uh, good morning, everyone, um, online and in the room here. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning in uh, our journal club. Uh, I have two interesting talks this morning, and the first one is by our PhD candidate, Leslie Dowson, um, on antibiotic use near the end of life aged care homes and insights of nursing and general practice practitioners. We'll get started. Thank you very much. Um, just quickly, this presentation, uh, a version of it, was first given in Brisbane um, in February at the Australian Society of Antimicrobials annual scientific meeting. And I'd just like to thank my supervisors, Carolyn Marshall, Deborah Friedman, Kirsty Busing, Rhonda Stewart, and David Kong for their help. And this is a project that um, is still ongoing um, as part of my PhD research in antimicrobial stewardship in aged care homes. Oops. Sorry, just as I figure out once again how to advance the slides. No, it didn't. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, so, really importantly, um, not all residents of aged care homes are near the end of life. There are residents who live in aged care for 10 or more years in relative well health. Um, perhaps only needing assistance in activities of daily, one or two um, activities of daily living. Um, end of life is a term that typically refers to the final days or weeks of life when someone is in the final terminal progression of a life limiting illness. And we're using the term near the end of life because typically in palliative care, when somebody is put on an end of life pathway, um, they are designated as not for antibiotic treatment. Um, Palliative care services in aged care in Victoria are done um, in a rather ad hoc fashion. They become involved in the care usually if the uh, aged care home staff and general practitioner feel that they're unable to adequately, adequately care for the residents. So there are many residents who do die um, in aged care from life limiting illnesses that do not have palliative care services. Um, and those people would also be um, considered in this cohort. Um, so really we're talking about those people before they're designated not for antibiotic treatment or if they are never designated for antibiotic treatment. So in aged care homes, antibiotic use does increase in the final months of life, especially in the two weeks before death. And near the end of life, antibiotics are often started without the resident signs and symptoms meeting minimum criteria for initiation. So people who live in aged care often have multiple chronic comorbidities. Um, the signs and symptoms of infection can be vague and atypical, um, and this increases as the resident nears the end of life. Um, antibiotic use can cause side effects that does adversely affect the quality of life. This is really important as the residence nears the end when quality of life is of the utmost importance. And these include things such as nausea and diarrhea. And up to 75% of aged care home residents have indicated that there are some scenarios in which they would refuse antibiotic treatment. So advanced care planning, goals of care planning also feeds into these decisions about antibiotics at this time period. Um, so we're looking to describe the perceptions of the nurses and general practitioners regarding the antibiotic use near the end of life in aged care homes. Um, we're undertaking qualitative semi-structured interviews um, with aged care home nurses and GPs in Victoria. Uh, participants have been recruited through purposive and snowball sampling and interviews have been transcribed verbatim if the interviewees hasn't agreed to be audio recorded. The transcripts have been checked um, by myself for accuracy and familiarization and the transcripts were then entered into in vivo for analysis. <coughs> So once the transcripts get in entered into in vivo, we look to break them down or to code them to discover the themes. Um, we're using two frameworks um, deductively in a process of compare and contrast to elicit those themes. These are behavior change themes um, developed by Susan Mitchie's group, um, the COMBI and the TDF. Um, and essentially what they do is they break down the necessary components of the reason why a person behaves in a certain way. And the reason why we want to know this is because we want to know why antibiotics are used um, to excess in um, aged care homes towards the end of life. So we're looking for the capabilities, the opportunities and the motivations for those behaviors in the interview transcript. Um, we're using two levels of coding structure. So first a descriptive coding structure, which is just summarizing in a very literal ways, a few words, the basic topic of the passage. 
and then using those descriptive codings to try to interpret the data in a more in-depth process, looking for trends and patterns in the data as well. Um, so this is the first 12 interviews um, that have been analysed. Um, we've average age of 50 years. Um, more often than not, they were female, which is typical, especially when you're looking at nursing staff in aged care. And we've got six RNs, four GPs, and two enrolled nurses um, in the data that's being presented today. Um, they're quite an experienced group of people, um, spread across different agencies, four public, three non-for-profit, and five private aged care homes. Um, average number of years with the current aged care homes is 7.3, which is actually quite a lot for in aged care. And um, aged care home locations are mostly metro at this point in time. So descriptive code, as I said before, descriptive code um, is a very literal way of going through the transcripts um, and trying to um, analyze what people have said. And this is just a subset of the descriptive coding guide that we've uh, developed thus far. And I've kind of grouped the two most obvious, um, I guess, themes that you get from just looking at the descriptive codes. And the first one is um, the emotion that comes out towards the end of life is anger, fear, gratitude, relief, and sadness. And again, going through, it's just a very literal way when somebody comments about fear that gets coded as fear. And the second one it actually refers to the sheer number of um, agencies and health professionals that can become involved in a resident's life towards the end of life and in aged care home in general. So there's doctors including locums and specialists. Um, InReach is a Victorian state government initiative which is a hospital-based program and what they've been, um, what their aim is to do is to put hospital-based specialists into aged care homes to try to avoid unnecessary hospitalization, uh, especially towards the end of life. And so they often come involved in the aged, in the residents' care towards the end of life when the aged care home feels that they cannot appropriately treat the resident. Um, there's now mobile x-ray units um, and then as well as there's also transfers that the resident can be transferred in and out of the aged care home, um, which happens at some frequency towards the end of life. And model of care really just refers to the whole umbrella, um, the, way that the, the way that all those different um, agencies and health professionals can feed into the resident's care. So I guess the first question that we wanted to know was, was in fact, um, this happening in Victorian aged care homes. Um, and what we've discovered is yes, aged care home nurses and GPs are prone to requesting or prescribing an antibiotic near the end of life when it's un unlikely to provide a benefit to the resident. So our first GP said, you feel like the benefits probably outweigh the risk, even if in the end it's completely futile. And our nurse said, a lot of our advanced dementia pneumonia patients will do a trial of care, and it's usually for the family. The reason we do it is for the family aren't ready to say enough is enough. Um, and lastly, the last nurse said, look, it's understandable what the GP did. And so in this case, she was describing an incident where a GP described an antibiotic when he knew that, it, when he believed it was futile, because sometimes you just do things to make the family happy. So there's already some other things that are coming out just in those three quotes. Um, secondly, we wanted to look at the capability in the decision process. So how are these um, decisions actually made in aged care homes? Um, and in aged care homes, doctors do rely on the knowledge and the skills of the nursing workforce in their decision making about antibiotic prescribing near the end of life. Um, nurses are very powerful within aged care homes. They are the one that are there day in, day out. Um, even the regular GPs are sometimes seen as outsiders within the aged care home. And so the first GP is saying, look, for the most part, I'm trusting of the nurse's judgment. Um, so that GP is relying on the nursing staff. And our second GP said, and you can do, with a good nurse, you can do a lot of things over the phone. So if we're talking about um, deciphering the signs and symptoms of infection in this case, that GP is relying on that nurse's skill to be able to, uh, to adequately describe um, those signs and symptoms of infection in order to get an antibiotic prescription over the phone. Um, and lastly, our nurse says, they're good too if you need them, as long as you direct them to what it is that they need. And so in that case, she's talking about inReach. So she's talking about the hospital specialist coming into the aged care home. And she says, yeah, they're good, but you still need to direct them to what the resident needs. So they do have to listen to the nursing staff and nursing workforce. And this has also come out quite a bit when we talk about the advanced care planning documents. Um, 
it's a very um, different process depending on what home that you're in, where the advanced care planning documents are, how they're done, where they're stored, um, and also how they're written. Um, and so especially if you're a locum doctor or somebody who's not a regularly sees the resident, um, you are reliant on that nursing staff to number one, show you where the advanced care planning documents are if you need to make a decision, but also help you decipher what it, it actually is that they're saying because they can be vague. So we need to look at what the nurses' behaviors are and what it is that the motivations behind these nurses' behaviors um, when we are looking at futile or unnecessary antibiotic use. So fear can drive aged care home nurse behaviors, which can lead to antibiotic misuse near the end of life. So our first nurse is saying, you can't go into safe mode, you go into death mode, and you need to look at things from that perspective. It's not about sustaining and maintaining a life because you can't. So many nurses don't want to do that. It's about saving their life and doing it at every cost and not being blamed for it. So there's a lot of fear. There's fear of being blamed um, for a resident dying. There's fear of, um, of the family being angry at you. There's fear of bad press. There's fear of being... Um, referred to the coroner. There's a lots of fear um, that the nurses have spoken about. And so the nurse six is saying the bigger issues were actually around fear that the family would make complaints if they hadn't done the right thing. So in that case, there was a gentleman who in fact was designated not for antibiotic treatment, who was in fact given antibiotic treatment because um, they couldn't get a hold of the family and they were afraid that the family would make complaints. And lastly, the GP in, in discussing this and says it's a nervous a nervousness about feeling they have to do things. So what do we do about it? This is the word cloud that gets generated from in vivo from all those different transcripts. And what this is, is that um, it displays how often something is spoken about within the transcripts. And so in our transcripts, the two words that are most often um, spoken about is no and also care. So there's something about the power that we need to know more, there needs to be more knowledge. Um, and in fact, I just, I did another interview on Monday and that particular health practitioner was talking about the knowledge deficit that sometimes can exist in aged care. So to reduce antibiotic misuse near the end of life caused by those fear-based behaviors in aged care home, the education to support or enhance those nurses and GPs clinical skills and knowledge is required. So the first nurse, when asked what to do, she says, education, education, education. And nurse number four was interesting because she's actually a former palliative care nurse who's moved over into aged care. And so she can really describe, um, I guess, the, that knowledge deficit that can exist in aged care. So she's saying there's so much emphasis on a whole lot of things that aren't necessarily going to help a nurse be a good nurse. So she's talking about nursing education in general. <laughs> For every decision that I make, yeah, I'm making that decision for the right reason based upon my clinical assessment and based upon where the resident is in life. So they need to be able to make those decisions based on those clinical assessments and not on fear that the family is gonna make complaints or fear that they're gonna be referred to the coroner or um, a number of other fears that they've expressed that they have. And the last GP is talking about um, doing more appropriate or how her practice has changed over those years. Um, and being able to prescribe antibiotics more appropriately. And she says, but just because I'm more knowledgeable now. So over the years, she's picked up that knowledge and is being able to put it into practice. So why is this important? Um, and why do I think it's particularly important? And it's around, um, in when we talk about AMR and AMS, sometimes we do default to fear-based language. And I would really caution against putting more fear-based language into aged care at this point in time. Um, I think it needs to be very much done in a supportive way um, instead. And we need to remember that those nursing workforces are important conductors of antibiotic decisions. So even though they are not the one actually doing the prescribing, an aged care home nurse can get an antibiotic if she, if she feels it's necessary, even if it's waiting until after hours and calling the locum. Um, so they really need to make sure that those nurses are supported in AMS in aged care as well. And again, fear can drive antibiotic prescribing in aged care home near the end of life. And that support to develop those clinical skills and knowledge to counter those fear-based antibiotic prescribing is required. Um, 
training nurses to engage effectively with families may help, um, as well as having GPs discuss those goals of care up front before those decisions are actually required. So when I ask specifically about whether or not antibiotics feature in advanced care planning discussions or goals of care, the answer is rarely does that actually happen. Um, it's not up until the time that there's actually a decision need to be made that that is often brought up. Um, and future antimicrobial stewardship initiatives um, should consider these findings. And again, this work is ongoing and we are still currently looking for um, particularly GPs to speak with us <laughs> at this point in time. So I just want to thank everyone who participated and any questions. So just if education is so important, how do, I guess, nurses start in aged care homes with education? Uh, do they seek it or does it kind of come from them? It depends. It's, it, it's very hard to talk about aged care as a sector as a whole because there are so many different um, like models that different organizations have. So most private organizations will have a head of quality, a head of safety, something along those lines. And it's usually an experienced nurse who is, also has some nurse education um, role as well and will go in and talk to the homes. Whereas, you know, say a, a public organization who is affiliated with like Royal Melbourne or somewhere else, they can kind of leach into all the other services in the acute hospital and get the education that way. So for example, like the infection prevention teams can go in and talk to them. So it is a bit ad hoc. Um, and that's just the way aged care works because it is considered to be a community care. It's, you know, they are to use the resources that are available to the community. Um, the person I spoke to on Monday as well said, people have to remember that, you know, it's a aged care is not acute care. Like it would be great <laughs> if you could get those resources, but unfortunately that kind of thing is a bit ad hoc throughout the system. And do you think there's differences in prescribing practices between public aged care facilities, private aged care facilities and religious? I really don't know. I, that would be interesting to find out. I think there's differences in the antibiotic prescribing practices between GPs. Like I really think that, um, and there actually has been work in aged care in this regards is that about the habits of the GPs are sort of paramount <laughs> is that, you know, a GP who just habitually prescribes the same thing all the time, that is what's really going to going to drive your prescribing. Um, and I think, you know, there has been um, successful AMS initiatives in different places um, that have focused on the GPs. But I think that the part that they are missing is that nurse component and feeding into um, sort of some of those drivers that come within the aged care home and the pressures that they can feel from families and things. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not sure. I think, you know, there would be some of that, um, but I think it's, it's, still yeah, I think it's still based, based on largely on the GPs, the prescribing that you get. So that's an educated guess. Yeah. With the perceptions of the nurses and the general practitioners that there's pressure from the family. Um, are these perceptions based on their interactions with the families or are they just assumptions about what the families are um, So I would say both. So there are stories that I've been told where there is direct pressure from the family to do certain things. But I also think that there are, I have been told stories where it's more of an avoidance thing. It's like we don't want conflict with this family. So will assume that that this is what they want which is the treatment so i think it's it's both but that assumption that we don't want conflict or there's going to be conflict with the family is usually rooted in something that has already happened uh, before where there has been a source of conflict with the family like um, you don't kind of get that perception out of nowhere usually um, aged care is 
it's, um, there is a lot of just fear generally in aged care and a lot of the media stories that come around um, feed into that as well and the general perception in the community about, you know, the quality of care, um, which, you know, there are, you know, legitimate reasons and places for concern, right? But um, it, it affects the entire industry when that kind of comes. And so they do get frightened and families get frightened too, right? Like, you know, you see something in the media about something that happened at this particular aged care home, your mom's in an aged care home, you suddenly have questions about that, right? And there's again, the nervousness that they talk about. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Um, our next speaker is another one of our um, PhD fellows, uh, Laura Hartfelt, and she'll be talking about veterinary students' um, knowledge perceptions of antimicrobial stewardship. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Rod. I've actually finished my PhD. Oh, yes, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a project that we did at the end of last year, um, where we wanted to do a survey of um, vet students' knowledge and perceptions. Um, so obviously we know there's a long association between antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance, and there is plenty of evidence that both direct and indirect contact with animals um, can lead to acquisition of multi-resistant organisms. So that can be zoonotic, where it comes from uh, animals to humans, but it also can be zooanthropnotic, where it goes from people to animals. Um, and there's plenty of examples in the literature of both of those. Um, in some surveys we did at the start of my PhD, we found that inappropriate prescribing of antimicrobials was common in veterinary practices across all sectors. Um, and we found that recent graduates prescribed less appropriately. So graduates in the first five years of practice seem to be prescribing less appropriately than older practitioners. And so the question obviously arose is whether that was a problem with the teaching of veterinary students um, or whether this was something else that was going on. Um, and we did suspect that it was more going to be around the fear of something going wrong in, in those early years in practice and, and maybe some peer pressure from colleagues as well. Um, but we thought it would be good to um, do a survey of veterinary students and, and find out, um, just make sure that the education um, was, was appropriate. So, and WHO has this nice quote where education of healthcare workers and medical students on rational antimicrobial prescribing or AMS is an integral part of all resistance containment activities. And I guess we would argue that education of veterinarians is equally as important. Um, so we also wanted to look at biosecurity in this survey, and it's not the control of biological weapons. Um, <laughs> when I submitted the paper, they were like, biosecurity, isn't that biological weapon control? <laughs> um, so it's not in veterinary medicine. Biosecurity is the set of preventative measures that are designed to reduce and uh, the risk of transmission of infectious disease. So it's really infection control. Um, but in veterinary medicine, we call it biosecurity. So um, there's been some surveys of biosecurity in the veterinary profession and uh, around 45% um, of vets in 2013 reported contracting a zoonosis during their career. Most of these zoonoses are pretty um, innocuous ones like ringworm, um, but um, certainly there are some uh, well-known, more severe zoonoses out there, um, particularly Hendra virus, I guess, has got a lot of press recently, but equine um, psittacosis and avian psittacosis um, are pretty high risk for, for vets working with those species as well. Um, and multi-drug resistance is also um, a, a risk for veterinarians. Equine vets carry the highest rate of MRSA in the Australian 
um, population, veterinary population, up to 23 times that of the rate of the general public. That's pretty consistent across the world. So these studies have been done in Europe and in the US as well. And equine vets seem to have the highest um, carriage rates of MRSA. I haven't looked at other multi-resistant organisms, so it's hard to know if it's just an MRSA thing or if we carry higher rates of um, other multi-resistant organisms. Um, but this study in the US, so it was a US population, not an Australian population, reported that the use of um, pretty basic personal protective equipment, so washing your hands and wearing gloves, um, resulted in uh, equine vets having a 65% lower odds of carriage of MRSA. So my conclusion from this is that equine vets are grots, um, but <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll leave that. <laughs> Um, so there's been lots of surveys in other sectors similar to this. Um, in medical students, uh, I found surveys in India, China, Italy, the US, France and in Europe, um, but none involving veterinary students in those, um, in those uh, countries. There is one relatively recent multi-sector approach, a One Health approach, um, that was done uh, just recently in 2018. Um, but published sorry, in 2018, but the numbers in each of the sectors was really small. I think there was only about um, 50 or 60 vet students who answered the survey. So they weren't able to make comparisons across the, um, the different sectors. So the aim of this study was to address the gap in understanding of veterinary students' knowledge and attitudes and to assess the adequacy of current educational efforts and the factors influencing student attitudes and perceptions about uh, stewardship and biosecurity. So we did a cross-sectional survey. It was multi-centre, so there's seven veterinary schools in Australia and we involved all of them. Um, I had collaborators at each of the veterinary schools. We were only interested in students graduating at the end of last year and at the end of this year. Um, so there was about 1,200 of them. And we did that because we were interested on, uh, in the effect of the clinical training year. So the veterinary schools are generally five to seven years of training now, but all of them have that final year as being a clinical only year. So it's like an intern year. Um, so all of the students that were in the 2017 graduating class were at the end of their clinical training. All of the students at the, uh, 2000, in the 2018 graduating class were at the end of their preclinical training, the end of their lectures, but yet to go into that intensive clinical year. So we did it between October and November, so we were catching them at the end of that year. Um, it was voluntary and anonymous. We needed about 400 students at about 50 from each university to allow for comparisons between the schools. And we recruited um, by a whole bunch of different mechanisms. The questionnaire itself was developed in REDCap, um, which is a survey software um, tool online. There were six questions and 88 um, six sections and 88 questions, so were mostly closed. Um, the first bit was just a little bit about the demographics. The second, um, which is the, the image there on the right hand side, um, is just an example of the type of uh, questions the students got. So this one was the uh, antimicrobial importance rating. So we used ASTAG and we asked the students to say if they thought that antimicrobial was first line, second line or third line or um, low importance, medium importance, high importance rated. Um, the, second, the third section was a use of antimicrobials for specific um, scenarios and we used a Likert-like um, scale for that. Um, the fourth was looking at the use of culture and susceptibility for specific scenarios. I, I will say um, all of the scenarios were across all sectors, so it wasn't just small animals, it was small animals and large animals, um, some exotics and some intensive animal questions. The fifth section we asked about the level of biosecurity um, for, eight, for specific scenarios, and then we finally asked about the knowledge of common guidelines and experiences of teaching. So the entire section for each part had to be completed to be included in the analysis. Um, we did some dis descriptive stat scat stats, um, looked at a multi-level logistic um, regression model, including random effects for the universities, um, and the open responses were openly coded um, and analyzed just using content analysis. So they were analyzed um, uh, qualitative, uh, quantitatively, not qualitatively. 
So 500 students completed the survey, 30 of them were incomplete and we discarded them. So we ended up with 476, which is about 38% of the entire population. Um, it was about half and half 2017 and 2018 graduates. And we got a significant sample obtained um, from six of the seven veterinary schools. So unfortunately, um, one of the veterinary schools uh, graduates their students in August. Um, and so uh, it made it, um, it just was out of kilter with their system to, uh, to get a sample from that school. So you can see there that CSU at the top, um, we only had 2018 graduates and um, we didn't get too many of those. Um, we asked the students about what area they were interested in um, and unsurprisingly, 40% um, were small animal interested um, around the same were mixed practice and then a mix of the others. Um, so that's pretty typical of, of the veterinary student population. Um, we asked students about um, their opinion of the contribution of antimicrobial use by vets to the overall burden of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and the most common response was moderate, which fits with um, this. The graph on the right is a survey that we did um, of veterinarians uh, last year to look at the enablers and barriers of stewardship. Um, and similarly, when we asked um, veterinarians about the contribution of overall veterinary use to the burden of, of AMR in humans, um, they also thought it was moderate. Interestingly, um, when we asked them about their individual uh, contribution, they thought it was minimal, which um, is pretty consistent with what you find uh, with GPs as well. So underestimating their own personal contribution, um, but um, thinking that their uh, the profession's contribution was moderate. Um, there's little consensus between the professions in Australia about the proportion, uh, proportional role of uh, the evolution of each sector in the evolution of resistance. Um, the students identified the main reasons underlying the contribution as overuse of antimicrobials, especially in food animals. And similarly, in, in that um, survey we did of vets, we asked them about why they, they thought um, that the, the use were, their use was um, minimal, but the, uh, that the profession's use was, uh, contribution was moderate. And in general, there's this blame shifting tendency where the small animal vets think it's the large animal vets and the large animal vets think it's the intensive animal vets and the intensive animal vets think it's the humans, <laughs> the human doctors. So um, I think that given the population of vets that uh, students were with their interest in um, small animals and, and small animal or mixed practice, I think it's not too surprising that they found, that we found this is the most common, um, that they thought that um, overuse in food animals was a reason. Uh, and then the low use of culture and susceptibility testing, which is a, is a big problem in the veterinary profession and one that's very difficult to combat given the, the um, costs associated with culture and susceptibility and the, um, the unlikelihood that that will change in the future. However, in Australia, the use of antimicrobials in food animals is modest in most industries. Um, and most of the moldy resistant organisms are coming from companion animals, not from food animals. So most of the reports come out of companion animals. Um, and certainly the, the um, surveillance work that's been done, which has all been pilot programs, there is an ongoing surveillance, but um, has found really low levels of resistance in food animal species, um, in most food animal species in Australia. And with evidence of both uh, direct and indirect contact with animals resulting in zoonotic transfer of these resistant organisms and really high level rates of pet ownership in Australia, it's likely that companion animals actually pose the greatest risk um, to the community. So it's probably um, antimicrobial use in, in companion animals that is the highest risk um, to people in Australia. So the second part is um, we asked students to um, tell us what they thought, I'm just gonna try and move that, um, where they thought antimicrobials were um, importance rated. So we can see that um, penicillin and amoxicillin um, greater than 80% thought that, um, or correctly identified these as first line therapies. So in green, we've got um, correctly identified. In um, blue, we've got higher than um, the correct, identified at higher than the correct level. And in red, we've got identified at lower than the correct level. So um, penicillin and amoxicillin, they, they got these four. 
Um, some of these were a bit of a concern. So enrofloxacin, amoxicillin, clavulanate and cefavicin are pretty commonly used in veterinary practices in Australia. And lots of the students identified these at a lower rate. So they're all, um, so enrofloxacin and cefavicin, which is a third generation cephalosporin, are both, um, uh, both high importance rated, so third line therapies, and amoxicillin clavulanate is the second line, and lots of students downgraded these by a class, so didn't recognise their importance. Um, so around 60% um, were, more than 60% were identifying them as that. Chloramphenicol is an interesting one. Lots of students um, identify this as higher um, importance rating, so it's actually a low importance rated antimicrobial, but they um, picked it up a class or two. I think that's um, chloramphenicol gets a really bad rap in the veterinary industry because of the uh, side effects that can occur in people from handling the drug. Um, and so I think it's rarely used in veterinary practice in Australia and um, and also, uh, and therefore I think is uh, was perceived by students to be um, of a higher importance rating. We found that 2018 graduates, so the students at the end of their preclinical teaching, were about 50% less likely to identify antimicrobials correctly compared to 2017 graduates. So it seemed that exposure to the, the clinical environment allowed students to have a, a more, uh, a better appreciation of the antimicrobial importance rating. So probably just um, a greater exposure to antibiotics in that final year. So we know that Australian vets use amoxicillin, clavulanate and cefavicin um, pretty frequently. Um, the guidelines, antimicrobial use guidelines, largely recommend amoxicillin alone as a first-line therapy and cefavicin is registered for use in Australia only after culture and susceptibility testing, although we know that um, that's widely, it's widely used off-label. Um, I've already said that uh, chloramphenicol was rated higher the NAS tag by lots of students, um, and we discussed the reasons for that. <clears throat> so um, the next section, we asked them about the use of antimicrobials for specific scenarios. So we've got the scenarios here on the left-hand side. Um, in red, if they always or frequently use the antimicrobials, um, or would frequently, always or frequently. In green, if they rarely or never would use them. Um, and in blue, if they're not sure. Um, so, oops, go back. Um, we can see down here, um, these are the ones that were most, uh, conditions where antimicrobials were most frequently used for. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. But um, for all of these conditions, antimicrobials would not be indicated. Um, and uh, it was good to see that um, less than 10% of students would be using antimicrobials for a routine desexing. Um, in the surgical survey that we did last year, we found that around um, half of the veterinarians were still using antimicrobials for these sorts of surgeries. So hopefully um, we are getting a change in um, behaviour as, as um, younger vets come through. But still we had for routine dentals and routine geldings, um, around a third of students um, would still use antimicrobials. Uh, the 2018 graduates were more likely to propose appropriate prescribing in large animal scenarios than 2017 graduates, um, but there was no difference in the small animal scenarios. So it seems that um, exposure to large animal practice might be um, enticing students into using inappropriate antimicrobial therapy. So um, again, that high proportion of students indicated that they would always or frequently use antimicrobials for a cannon wound. Um, and that was very similar to a survey, um, the survey we did last year um, of equine vets where I think it was about the same 97% and it's also the same in the UK. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so the cannon bone is um, metacarpal three, um, which is the main, um, the horses don't have five metacarpals, they only have three, but the two, two and four are um, rudimentary. So um, metacarpal three is the, the main bone going from the knee to the ankle of a horse. Um, and it's probably the most commonly uh, air, common area that horses get wounds um, and uh, it doesn't involve a synovial structure um, and they generally heal um, pretty well um, but can be frustrating due to movement and that sort of thing. So um, 
But in general, the guidelines don't recommend antimicrobials for uncomplicated wounds, so wounds not involving synovial structures, um, and can wounds fit into that category? Um, but across, um, certainly across the UK and Australia, where there has been surveys, um, vets, uh, it's really frequently used and, um, and with no um, real impact on, um, on recovery in those cases, so we know that they don't get better any faster. Uh, an uncomplicated draining abscess in a cat, we had about 80%. Um, similarly, guidelines um, recommend against such use. The hemorrhagic diarrhoea in dogs is um, a bit of a complicated one because the guidelines uniformly don't recommend antimicrobial therapy, but there are still some of those older small animal textbooks um, that are recommending therapy um, in those cases. Uh, and so even though there's there has been a big shift in the veterinary community to not use uh, antimicrobials for hemorrhagic diarrhea. It's, I think there is still some uncertainty in, in vets' minds. Um, so we need educational efforts in these areas. Uh, and as I said, it seems that exposure to large animal clinical um, practice may be teaching students inappropriate antimicrobial use, whereas that clinical experience did seem to be um, improving their knowledge on the rating of uh, antimicrobial importance. So the third section was looking at culture and susceptibility. Um, so again, um, if they would always or frequently perform culture and susceptibility, it's in green, rarely or never is in red, and not sure is in blue. Um, so we have um, a lot of severe and recurrent infections down here at the bottom um, where students would always or frequently um, perform culture and susceptibility testing. Um, and um, a lot of these um, kind of milder or, um, or first occurrence up the top. Interestingly, a lot of the uh, scenarios that we pose to do with cattle appear at the top of this list. So um, culture and susceptibility testing in large animal practice. Um, in fact, it's, it's probably done the most for mastitis in cattle, um, but for other conditions, it's pretty rarely performed unless there's an outbreak on a farm and, um, and they're looking for, for a vaccine or something like that that might be able to be used. So severe and recurrent, um, the most important factors that students identified as, um, as uh, leading them to perform culture and susceptibility were persistent infections, recurring infections and severe infections and um, client finances, which we know influences um, the um, performance of culture and susceptibility testing. So in small animal scenarios, our 2018 grads were um, more likely to always or frequently perform culture and susceptibility testing, um, but there was no difference in large animal scenarios. So they were all pretty unlikely to use culture and susceptibility in large animal scenarios. Um, but it does seem that exposure to the low use of culture and susceptibility in practice may influence students' decision making um, after they've had that exposure in their final year. Um, so finally, we asked them about um, biosecurity or personal protective equipment. Um, and uh, in green, we've got appropriate biosecurity. Um, in the dark green, we've got they use too much PPE for the scenario. Um, red is not enough and blue was not sure. Um, so uh, for routine exams in, horse, in pretty much all of the species, um, it was encouraging that they were using um, appropriate PPE. Um, but there were these four conditions at the top where PPE was done really badly. Um, these two, they should have known about. So um, poor conception rates in goats is very commonly associated with Q fever. Um, and students, there is a high, um, there is a big knowledge and Q fever has been around for a long time. Lots of students have vaccinated against Q fever. It's got a long association with goats. Um, they should have known that um, this was a Q fever scenario. Um, and similarly, the respiratory disease in a galah um, is a psittacosis scenario. And um, that disease has been around for a long time as well and well recognized to be um, a disease of, of, um, of galahs and of other, um, of other psittacine birds. So uh, they should have known about the PPE required for those two scenarios. Um, uh, 2000, sorry, the other two scenarios um, were uh, 
were edging towards equine psittacosis, um, which is a relatively new emerging disease uh, in veterinary practice. So um, it was first described um, in 2016, um, where a bunch of students from CSU, Charles Sturt University in Wagga, um, and some staff developed psittacosis after exposure to an equine placenta. Um, and since that time, there's been uh, an effort to have some surveillance of psittacosis in the equine population, and they've found quite a lot of psittacosis, both in neonatal foals and in, um, and in uh, postpartum mares in the Hunter Valley, um, as well as in uh, southern New South Wales, but it probably occurs everywhere. Um, they're having trouble getting equine personnel to go in and get tested. Um, and also the test is really bad in people for detecting psittacosis um, or exposure to psittacosis. And so it's a really tricky, um, tricky thing to uh, have a good grasp on whether it is um, a, a zoonosis. But certainly the, there was, I think there was eight people exposed in that CSU outbreak and six of them had to be hospitalised. So um, it certainly uh, does pose a risk and um, is another reason not to go back into equine clinical practice for me. <laughs> 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 um, so we found that the 2018 graduates were more likely to use appropriate PPE for large animal scenarios um, than the 2017 uh, graduates. So um, maybe the low use of PPE in practice is encouraging students to stop using the PPE that they should be using, although it wasn't a huge um, odds ratio, it was only a 15% uh, increase. And interestingly, University of Student, Sydney students were more likely to use appropriate PPE um, uh, for large animal scenarios than students from all other unis. And that was largely due to an, to an improvement in those, their answers to those questions about psittacosis. So um, I, maybe they've got someone, a psittacosis person at Sydney Uni, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not where the outbreak occurred. So you, um, maybe if we'd had more CSU students, we would have seen that they knew about um, psittacosis as well. The one that um, I found concerning, even though it sits in the middle here, um, is this one in the horse, which is uh, a Hendra case. Um, and we still had 30% of students not using appropriate PPE um, when they were looking at this horse, which should have rung alarm bells for Hendra. Um, so that's a, that was a concern to me as well. So our 2018 graduates were more likely to propose appropriate use of PPE for large animal scenarios, um, but students really need to be aware of the measures needed to protect themselves and others from zoonoses. And there's been quite a few prosecutions of vets in Queensland recently about um, inappropriate use of PPE and inappropriate recommendations for PPE um, for uh, owners of horses um, in, that are hendra suspects and um, uh, uh, in that testing phase, um, for because vets are not uh, uh, not um, advising appropriate PPE, um, so we really, you know, this should be an area of um, pretty um, of of uh, education, I think, and we we need more um, work in this area. We need to know what methods um, we should be using to convey these messages to students. So then we asked them about what they, they're teaching and um, that sort of thing. And so in green is strongly agree in, um, or agree in blue is neither and um, in red is uh, disagree or strongly disagree. Um, so in general, they um, knew about AMR mechanisms and um, what they, what AMS is, so that was good. Um, they, in general, knew how to use antimicrobials to minimise the risk of antimicrobial resistance, or they thought they did anyway, they had a perception that they did. Um, but at the top here, we asked them if what they learnt in about antimicrobial use in clinics is what the same is the same as what was taught in lectures. Um, and you know, almost uh, half of the students disagreed with that. So um, what they're getting taught in clinics is not the same as what they're getting taught in, um, in lectures. And if what they were taught in clinics is more useful than what they were taught in clinics, um, and only um, and around 40% of students agreed with that statement as well, with only 30% um, disagreeing or strongly disagreeing. So um, for whatever reason, students perceive that what they learn in clinics is really useful, I guess is probably that perception that it's practical um, and therefore um, more 
uh, day to, what they need to know day to day rather than um, the what they get taught in in the academic sense. Um, yeah. So, with that question, it could be that they're learning different things in academic yep. or something that contradicts lectures. Yep. Are you able to? I guess only with what we asked in the second one, with whether it was more useful or not. Um, so, um, but certainly um, it could be different um, and or just a completely different topic rather than, yeah. So there's no, it's, it's not saying that they're getting contradictory messages? Not necessarily, no. no. So um, our 2017 grads um, had poorer compliance with guidelines and lower use of uh, culture and susceptibility and inadequate PPE. Um, but the, the, this, so then we asked them about pharmacology teaching um, and the amount of, we asked them if the amount of teaching for pharmacology is about right um, and almost half of them disagreed with that. So they wanted more knowledge about antimicrobials um, and similarly I would knowledge about pharmacology of antimicrobials and um, about only about 40% of them agreed with that. And that's also really common in, in students in other, um, in medical students as well. So lots of the studies have found that students feel like they don't have enough knowledge about antimicrobial pharmacology. Um, but these were good, so um, teaching time for prudent use of antimicrobials and um, how to use antimicrobials to minimise the risk of resistance was also, um, students um, thought that was okay. Students were largely aware of at least one of the antimicrobial prescribing guidelines currently available, um, but only 12% reported referring to these frequently. Um, similarly, we had a good awareness of biosecurity guidelines, but um, even less students ref um, reported referring to these. Um, and so it's common, it, you know, we know that this is common in medical practice as well, but um, it's likely that the reasons are different um, and we need some more investigation into this area. So in conclusion, this was the first multi-study um, centre investigating vet students' knowledge and attitudes about stewardship and biosecurity. Um, it's unique because it compared those uh, the two years of veterinary students and so we were able to gain insights into the progressive acquisition or loss of antimicrobial stewardship <laughs> principles. Um, in general, it seems that preclinical stewardship teaching is superior to clinical teaching and we really should have efforts to ensure, um, made to ensure there's consistency. And antimicrobials with high importance rating that are commonly used in veterinary practice should be identifiable by students. So I wanna thank um, my collaborators from the other universities. Um, there was a lot, took a lot of time and effort to recruit all these students. And so um, it was great to have somebody at each of the unis to, to push the cause. Um, and of course, um, Helen and James and Glenn are happy to answer any questions. I didn't do any qualitative, I just did content analysis. So I just coded them um, as to the content and then, um, and then counted them essentially. So, yeah. Did the students get feedback on these results, you know? Uh, not yet, um, they, but we, at, so the University of Sydney, well, a few of the unis have asked for their individual results mm -hmm. back. Um, so where there was a significant sample, um, we were able to return those results um, to the individual unis. So, um, and obviously the, my collaborators have the um, overall results and the results for their individual uni as well. So, um, so the 2017 grads are off and away, but, um, but we may repeat the survey at some stage as well. And especially at the University of Melbourne, because we've, uh, implemented a stewardship program in the teaching hospital this year. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see if the students' um, perceptions change um, with that in place. So. Mm -hmm. Who to feed our students? Because we feed the Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to actually say, look, um, you know, this, this isn't me. Yeah. Um, picked up as a thought that should be my yep. scared them into 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kirst? Um, given that the 2018 grants, do you plan to look at them again to see if they're like directly compare their answers. <laughs> that, that might be a more appropriate comparison than two different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if we'll do it again on a national scale um, yeah. this year, but uh, I think we probably will do it on a limited scale, you know, yeah. um, rollout. So, yeah. Um, so um, I got asked if there was a plan to better incorporate CSU students within a future study, um, given that these students would be those who identify graduating in August and the CSU teaching model is fairly different from other schools, as I understand. Um, so yeah, we should, um, it, we would need to target those CSU students at a different time point. Um, and then roll it out at the other unis um, later in the year. So um, if we had been more organised, we could have done that um, and we should do it for future studies. I don't think there'd be any contamination by releasing the survey early um, at a different uni. So there's no reason why we shouldn't do that in the future. So. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone, um, both online and in the room um, for today's General Club. Uh, some interesting things coming out about uh, aged care and veterinary things, which um, we often don't think about in our little hospitals. And it's actually really good to see that lots of interesting things are happening. And I think some common problems are kind of being seen across all these uh, uh, organisations. So we can kind of do some knowledge sharing and help um, out our uh, veterinary counterparts. So I think, you know, a lot of the and a lot of the vet students' um, information is probably very, very similar to the medical students, so you'd imagine, um, especially with my experience, is very, very common. Uh, so thank you. Um, we'll convene again in about a month's time, and thanks, for everyone, um, for contributing.